Let's have a look at some more cases to help us distinguish between what are facts and what are not facts for the purposes of the first element of misrepresentation, namely that a misrepresentation must relate to past or existing fact. In Smith and Land House Property Corporation, a property was being sold with a sitting tenant. The seller had told the buyer that the tenant was a most desirable tenant. Now, when we first hear those words, we might think that that is merely an opinion, and thus not subject to the laws of misrepresentation. However, the court held that in the circumstances, the words most desirable tenant were more than a mere opinion. The seller, who was of course the landlord, was in a unique position to be able to judge the tenant. Furthermore, the tenant had not been paying his rent. Those are facts which only the seller could have known. And therefore, when the seller told the buyer that the tenant was most desirable, he in fact misrepresented what the tenant was. Because of course, in fact, the tenant was not desirable at all. Who would want to have a tenant who doesn't pay his rent? In Dimmick and Hallett, Mr. Dimmick was interested in buying a farm. The farm was being sold at auction, and the advertisement mentioned that the farm had fertile and improvable land. However, in fact, a lot of the land was abandoned and useless. The court held that the use of the words fertile and improvable were a flourishing description. Put another way, the court essentially held that where we have such high sounding words in an advertisement, the buyer must expect that those words may be overblown and thus this was not an example of misrepresentation, at least not in respect of the words fertile and approvable. As we shall see later, Dimmock and Hallett was in fact a case of misrepresentation, but for a different reason. Similarly, we can look at the case of Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, which everyone should know very well. Of course, in that case, there was also an advertisement. And in that case, the advertisement was deemed to be serious, and the words of the advertisement were held to be binding and capable of being a unilateral offer that resulted in a contract. Had the advertisement in Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company been less specific, had it, for instance, just said that if you took these smoke balls, you would not get ill, then the court might have thought that this was a mere puff, and in any case, a mere puff cannot amount to misrepresentation. Lastly, in respect of misrepresentation having to be related to a past or existing fact, let's look at the special situation of statements of law. Now, up until 1999, it was thought that any statement of law was not capable of being a misrepresentation. That is because everyone is expected to know the law. Thus, where someone made a statement of law, this could not amount to misrepresentation. This changed with the 1999 case of Plangwood Benson and the Lincoln County Council. For our purposes, we can look at the case of Pancania and Hackney London Borough Council, which illustrates very neatly how the new law in relation to statements of law and misrepresentation works. In that case, Pancania purchased property, believing that the tenants of that property were merely licensees and that their tenancy could be terminated on three months' notice. Now, it was the Hackney London Borough Council which had provided them with that information. Essentially, that is a statement of law. However, in reality, the tenants were protected under the Landlord and Tenant Act. It was held that the statement by the London Borough Council was in fact misrepresentation as to law. Therefore, the law as it now stands is that statements as to law may be actionable misrepresentations. 
Let us now move on to the second element of misrepresentation. That is that the misrepresentation must be false. Now normally that is not a problem. The statement is either true or it is false. But there are situations where we can't be sure. For instance, in the case of Dimmock and Hallett, which was the case about the sale of the farm, not only was a statement made as to the fertility of the land, which we already know was deemed not to be a misrepresentation, there was also a statement made regarding tenants on that farm. The buyer saw that the farm included some houses and inquired whether those houses had tenants. The seller stated that indeed the houses were occupied by tenants. What the seller didn't mention is that those tenants had in fact already tendered their terminations and that they were going to be leaving soon. Thus, when the contract was complete and the buyer took over the property, the tenants were gone. Now, technically, at the time that the seller said that there were tenants, that was a true statement because there were tenants. But it was only a half truth because the seller knew that those tenants wouldn't be around for much longer. The court deemed this to be an actionable misrepresentation. Another case we've already looked at is Gordon and Seneca. This was the case of the painters covering up some dry rot so that the sellers of an apartment could conceal the fact that the apartment was in poor shape and the buyers didn't spot this and so they went ahead with the transaction. This was a case of deliberate concealment and the court held that this was a case of a false statement which amounted to actionable misrepresentation. A case that we haven't yet looked at is Spice Girls and Aprilia World Service. Aprilia World Service of course is an Italian motorcycle company specializing in selling scooters. Now Aprilia was interested in running an advertising campaign using the Spice Girls to sell more of their scooters. Aprilia went ahead with filming videos for the ad in which all five Spice Girls appeared. Incidentally, you can still find one of these ads on YouTube today. Now, shortly after this advertising campaign commenced, one of the five Spice Girls, Jerry Halliwell, left the band. And so Aprilia was stuck with a bunch of ads which had all five Spice Girls, where in fact the group was reduced to four. Aprilia refused to pay all the outstanding monies, and so they were sued by the Spice Girls. By their own admission, Aprilia felt that there had been no breach of contract, and in fact their legal position was not very strong. In the meantime, the Spice Girls, who had left the band, Jerry Halliwell, had published an autobiography, and in this autobiography she mentioned that she had told the other Spice Girls, the other four, that she was leaving the band, that she had decided to leave the band. Now, this decision to leave the band, and also the fact that she told the other Spice Girls, this happened before the contract with Aprilia was concluded. And all of a sudden, Aprilia had a much stronger legal position. Because now Aprilia was able to argue that the Spice Girls, when they concluded the contract, had in fact committed misrepresentation. That is, that they had misrepresented that there was going to be five Spice Girls when they knew that in short order there would only be four. This was deemed to be an actionable concealment and therefore a misrepresentation. Spice Girls ended up having to pay Aprilia a large sum of money. How about a situation where someone makes a statement which is true at the time, but circumstances change going forward and before the contract is concluded the statement becomes untrue. For this we can look at the case of With and O'Flanagan. Dr. O'Flanagan was in the process of selling his medical practice to Mr. With. Now when the negotiation started Dr. O'Flanagan stated 
that his medical practice had takings of 2,000 pounds per year, which was in fact true at the time that the statement was made. However, before their contract for sale of the medical practice was ultimately concluded, that number had gone down drastically. And Dr. O'Flanagan failed to disclose this. It was held that where a statement is true at the time it's made, but becomes false because of a change in circumstances before the contract is finally concluded, this amounts to actionable misrepresentation. Had the contract been concluded and the change in circumstances only occurred after this date, there wouldn't have been any actionable misrepresentation. You can also use the word continuing representation. That means when you make a statement, it continues to be a representation until the point in time when you finally reach agreement when the agreement is concluded. Let us now move on to the third and final element of misrepresentation, and that is that the misrepresentation must induce the contract. What this means is that it is not enough to merely show that there was a statement of fact, that the statement of fact was false, we must also show that that statement induced the contract. Let's look at some cases to see how this works. In Redgrave and Heard, Mr. Redgrave was a solicitor who was looking for a partner for his business. Mr. Heard was a potential partner, and during the negotiations, whereby Mr. Heard would buy into Mr. Redgrave's business, Mr. Redgrave stated that the business brought in 300 pounds per year. In fact, the business only brought in 200 pounds per year. Mr. Redgrave offered that Mr. Hurd could have a look at the company's statements in order to verify those numbers. However, Mr. Hurd believed Mr. Redgrave and went ahead with the deal. After he signed the documents, Mr. Hurd found out that the real number was only 200 pounds per year and not 300 pounds per year. And so he refused to go through with the deal. When Mr. Redgrave sued Mr. Hurd for specific performance, Mr. Hurd claimed that there had been a misrepresentation. The court held that in fact, there was a misrepresentation and therefore Mr. Hurd was able to rescind the contract. The court said that it didn't matter that Mr. Hurd had had an opportunity to check the statements of the company. What in fact happened was that Mr. Redgrave gave a false number, so this was an untrue statement of fact, and it was this untrue statement of fact, this particular number, 300 pounds per year, which induced Mr. Hurd to enter into the contract. So therefore, all the elements of misrepresentation were fulfilled in this case. We already talked about Edgington and Fitzmaurice. This was the case where debenture bonds were being sold, allegedly to buy equipment and expand the company. But in fact, the intention all along was to raise money in order to pay off some of the debts of the company. The company was in big trouble. Now, in this case, one of the arguments was that Mr. Edgington, the person who had bought those debenture bonds, had relied on different reasons as to why he went ahead to buy those bonds. The court held that it suffices that the promise that the money would be used to buy more equipment and to expand the business, that that was a reason why he bought the bonds. It doesn't have to be the only reason. So there may be multiple reasons why someone goes ahead with the transaction. So long as one of those reasons relates to the misrepresentation, that is enough to fulfill this third requirement whereby the misrepresentation must induce the contract. In Atwood and Small, Atwood purchased a mine from Small. Small had stated that the mine produced a certain output. Small also offered that Atwood could check the statements and documents of the mine to verify this. And Atwood went ahead and hired an accountant to have a look at those statements. The accountant didn't spot any errors, and so the transaction went ahead. Afterwards, it was discovered that those numbers were false. However, there was no misrepresentation because Atwood had relied on his own accountant and not on what Small said. 